I just want to welcome all of you here. We open with the song, Come Holy Ghost, because we need more of the ghost, a double dose of the ghost, if you will, in our world, in our church, and in our lives at all times. But I think especially right now, uh, in our world when it comes to love. This is um, a line from John Paul II from his book, Love and Responsibility. Love is the fullest realization of the possibilities inherent in man. The potential inherent in the person is most fully actualized through love. The person finds in love the greatest possible fullness of being, of objective existence. Love is an activity, a deed, which develops the existence of the person to its fullest. There are some big words in there. <laughs> But more or less, four times in a row, he affirms this reality, that for man to be who he's called to be, for him to be fully alive, he needs love. And it's only love that allows him to live to the fullest. And I think that's why most of you are here, hopefully, <laughs> right? To want to be fully alive, to want to love to the fullest, and to understand, like, what is this love all about? But we don't want this just to be a class. We want it not to be just about coming to learn more heady, intellectual things, but truly to transform our hearts, to allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts. And that's why we're here in this chapel. That's why the Blessed Sacrament is still here, so that we give God permission to work in our hearts. And so let's just say a prayer uh, inviting the Lord. Lord God, we beg you, pour forth your Holy Spirit in ever greater way upon each and every one of us here. Open up our hearts to you so we may come to know you and love you ever more fully. Break down all barriers, all fears, all obstacles that might keep us, Lord, from experiencing your love and giving our lives fully over to you. Amen. Turn it back over to, to Tom. He has a, a song that he wants to share with us. And then at the end, we're going to have Tom come back up, and he's going to give a, a witness at the end. And I think this song has something to do with that, right? This is a, it's exploring, the, exploring the mystery of what that love is. Uh, this was a song I wrote a long time ago. Uh, in fact, it's the first Christian song I ever wrote. And uh, you know, back in the day when I was just getting out of secular
chose me, it was I who chose you. sad but true story about a seven-year-old son who came into church for the first time with his mother and saw the crucifix for the first time and said, Mom, who is that? And the mom said, that's Jesus Christ. And he said, Mommy, don't say that. We're in church. <laughs> sad but true. Sad that the holy name of Jesus for so many people has been reduced to no, 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 you don't say that. That's a bad word. Bad word used in vain. Warning, Jesus Christ will be spoken of here. <laughs> Not in vain, but in the fullness of who he is. And also a warning, there might be some other words that are spoken here that might want to evoke a response of, Father, don't say that, we're in church. <laughs> And yet, a word like sex should make us feel a little uncomfortable. In the, in the sense that it has to do with the deepest, most intimate parts of who we are, who God created us to be, in terms of being male and female. But in another sense, why should we not speak of it in front of the Lord, in church? For if God is truly the creator of all things, he made even sex, man, male, and female. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. That was commandment number one. <laughs> God didn't waste any time. And so if we can't talk about it here in this place, then where else can we talk about it in the truth of what it is? I usually like to start off homilies with this quote from JP2. He says, man cannot live without love. Isn't that awesome? says man cannot live without love he remains a being that is incomprehensible to himself his life is senseless if love is not revealed to him if he does not encounter it if he does not experience it personally he cannot love he cannot live I grew up um, the great family <laughs> faith was always very important to me and Yet I know I was surrounded by a lot of lies about what love is. Growing up in public school where there was all of my friends watching these things on TV, listening to different music, and just kind of being bombarded with all of that. And I remember coming across JP2, uh, John Paul II, and some of his writings whenever I was in high school. And it just blew my mind. The beauty and the truth of everything that I was reading that really went against a lot of the lies that I had been hearing. And I don't think I ever would have imagined that, like, looking back at high school, that, you know, 15 years later, I'd be here standing in front of all of you, sharing something that has really changed my life, has really just uh, given me so much to really think about, pray about. I never would have imagined that. But especially for the last two years, I've been studying it 
an institute set up by John Paul II. It's called the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family. And so I've been able to dive in in a way that I'm like, Lord, thank you. I'm just spoiled. Here I am. Like, my life is just, I get to read about these awesome, incredible truths that God has imprinted in our very hearts, in our very bodies, so that we can come to know him and experience him and love him. Many of you uh, probably know the story. I want to take a step back and maybe just give like a context for how I'm, I want to approach this course. Many of you uh, maybe are familiar with the story of the emperor's new clothes. Do you know the story? <laughs> the story of the emperor who is incredibly vain and he's all about seeking the approval of all the people in the kingdom. And he's fooled whenever he hires two con men to make him the most impressive, beautiful suit ever known in the world. And they say, no, 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 Emperor, we can do it. We have this incredible material. It's invisible to everyone else, but it's the most beautiful in the entire world. And they go out and they make this beautiful suit, and then they finally come back to him and say, Emperor, it's ready for you. And it looks invisible, but anyone who questions it, it's just because they don't have the eyes to see. They're incredibly stupid if they can't appreciate the beauty and the magnanimity of this incredible suit. And so they dress him up, and meanwhile, he's taken off all of his other clothes, and so it looks like he's naked, but no one will say, uh, because they don't want to be labeled as the one speaking out against what everyone else is meant to believe, or made to believe. And so there goes the emperor in his brand new clothes, parading through the streets. And everyone has heard that if you question what he's wearing, you're going to be labeled as stupid, ignorant, or foolish. And there he is parading through, and everyone's cheering him on. Yes, yes, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Until an innocent child speaks up and says, Hey, why is the emperor naked? <laughs> And I think this is such a good like, kind of paradigm, an example of where we're at right now in terms of what I experience, even having a great family that loves me. And I had parents who really mirrored the love between a husband and a wife and a love for their children. And yet still living in the world that we do today, we can be like those people, those citizens who are made to think like, no, 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 don't question it. Don't question that he's naked. Don't question that he has nothing on because then you'll look foolish, ignorant. And so what do we need right now? Where, where do we go from, from here to really reclaim what is true? What's our approach? First of all, maybe let's think about what are some of the lies that are circulating? These lies that are said, well, if you question that, you're foolish, you're ignorant. Think about it. I'm sure you know a lot of them. <laughs> I think of how the sex education today has gone to the point where everything is just revealed at 12, 13 years old. And children are told that there's no difference between your genitals and your elbow. <laughs> They're all parts of your body. There's no difference between them. Sad but true. I think too about uh, the lie that, oh, well, the kids, they have no control over themselves. They're going to do it anyway, so why would we stop them? Why would we tell them anything differently? Right? These lies circulate into like, the education of our next generation of kids. And two, that a sexual encounter, a hookup between two people is no different than a handshake. No, 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 it doesn't mean anything. It's, yeah, it's just two people having, coming together for a little bit. Right, we hear this over and over again, and especially not too long ago, the, the, the rhetoric that again and again, there's no difference between a man and a woman. There's no difference. They're, they're the same. Right, so what do we need? What do we meet, need to move forward and to be able to call out these truths? Many of us are beyond the age of an innocent child to be able to say, hey, the emperor's naked. <laughs> So what do we rely on? What do we rely on as faithful Catholics? I'd like to propose faith. That we need faith. A faith to be able to see the truth. To be able to know the truth. But what is faith? What is faith? Maybe have a different definition in your mind of, of what it is. Maybe... 
let me take a step back. Looking at this course, <laughs> there are a lot of these objections, there are a lot of these things that are thrown out. The one thing that this course is not is that this course is not a response to all of these, all of these things, all the messages, all the messages of the world. That's not what we're, that's not what we're about. Um, and why? I, I think for a couple of reasons. I'm going to take the Five Guys approach. Anyone like Five Guys cheeseburgers? <laughs> I think the Five Guys cheeseburger company has done a great job at knowing that they have the best cheeseburger in the world. Maybe they don't tell you that, but they believe it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be producing these cheeseburgers. And yet, what would happen if they would go around to every single McDonald's, every single Burger King, and say, no, 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 you have an inferior burger. No, 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 your burger's terrible. No, no, no. They'd be exhausted. <laughs> They'd be exhausted. But what about the approach of just saying, no, we know that we have everything that you would ever want or dream about in a cheeseburger. And we're not going to go around shoving this cheeseburger down your throat saying, like, here it is, open wide and take it in. <clears throat> right? Who's going to actually enjoy a Five Guys cheeseburger like that? So what about if they just waft it? What if they just allowed the, the scent of the cheeseburger, to, the aroma, to naturally come over? Not in an intimidating fashion, but just experience it. Take it in. And hopefully that will draw you into recognizing just how good this cheeseburger is. Sorry. I love food analogies. <laughs> And it, they're real to me. I even think about how we have roosters down at the bottom of the hill and how I have to deny myself every time I drive home, like, a scoop above the rest. How do I not stop in? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, this course isn't about responding to all these things. I think we'd be exhausted in doing that. And that can be really hard because a lot of the rhetoric today from the side that produces this counterfeit, these lies about what love is, they have their message in these nice little 30 second commercial segments or nice little phrases like love is love, love makes a family, or why would you ever deny these people to love each other? Why? How could you do that? And all of a sudden if we start to try and like respond in an equally pithy and clever, concise answer, we start stumbling. Like, uh, it. But the church's answer has never been about just responding with pithy little one-liners. The truth can't be reduced just to one line. The truth is all-encompassing. And so this course is about much more than giving you a responses to these different attacks. I want to maybe waft, <laughs> waft the truth of what love is and all of its beauty and all of its grandeur so that you can take it in. And maybe you've heard this before. Maybe some of you have read John Paul II's work pretty hefty <laughs> if you've seen it. For five years, he spent 129 Wednesday audiences in Rome breaking open this theology of the body. And most of the people in the square there at St. Peter's, whenever they heard this, were like, huh? <laughs> you're, you're the Pope and you're talking about what? And he's like, no, 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 we need to have this whole vision. We need to know who is man. What is man about? What is he created for? What is love? Because John Paul II knew that if we don't answer these questions, it's not like we're just going to go through life knowing this. But like a vacuum, the messages of the world will come in, and those lies will con continue to come in and take root and even grow up and blossom, and all of a sudden we're believing these things that are just totally off. And so he, take, he took it upon himself to really... Recover. Recover in a beautiful way everything that it means to be man, everything that it means to be woman, and to be created in the image and likeness of God. So we're going to cover some of these topics that are difficult, <laughs> that kind of put us on edge. We're like, oh, I don't know how to respond to that. And if I try to, then all of a sudden I'm labeled as a hater or a bigot or a whatever. We will cover those. But from the perspective of seeing the wholeness of what love is all about, especially the love between a man and a woman that is meant to image the very trinity of Almighty God, 
snapshot of that, all right? So that, that's kind of the 12 week, 12 week proposal. So where do we start? I think we need to start with faith. What is faith? There's a fancy definition of faith that says that faith is the ascent of the will and the intellect to God as he reveals himself. Pretty heady, pretty like, hmm, what, is that? <laughs> what does that mean? An ascent of the intellect and the will. So whatever God reveals, I give myself fully over to this as being true. I love what Pope Benedict said about faith, though. He said this. Faith is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty ideal, but the encounter with an event. It's an encounter with a person that changes one's entire outlook on life, decisively. One's entire horizon of how they live, about how they view the world, is changed. He said that's faith. Faith isn't just a blind faith. Many of, many of us can think that way. That faith is just going to close my eyes, white knuckle it, and I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe, like the church is teaching, the gospels, the, it's really hard, but Lord, I believe. And that's not it. That's not faith. Faith is this encounter with Jesus Christ, with God, as he reveals himself in his fullness. And that's what this class hopefully, hopefully leads us to. John Paul II has a great line about faith and reason. Faith and reason that's so important for us today. Because many of us in the church are accused of being old-fashioned. Oh, faith, no, that's just superstitious stuff. That's for those in the medieval times, before we had science, right? Science has set us free, and now we know everything that we need to know. As if, you know, a lot of scientists will say, like, well, we had all these equa equations that had empty spaces that we couldn't quite figure out how it all worked together, and that was God. God was that, like, placeholder in there. But now science has come along. We don't need him anymore. Our equations all work. We can figure it out. We can calculate how it works. We don't need God. And John Paul II, like every other theologian in the church, has said, no, you're not understanding who God is. God isn't just one piece of the puzzle. He's the piece that creates the whole puzzle. <laughs> it's because of him that we can even know we can even come up with an equation. We can even come up with the rotation of the earth or the law of gravity or the equal and opposite forces, right? Like all of these come from God putting intelligibility into the world. So John Paul II said that faith and reason are like wings that allow the soul to ascend to the truth. Isn't that beautiful? Faith and reason going hand in hand. This is really good news. Because when we talk about the truth of love, when we talk about the beauty of it all, we need to have confidence that whatever comes at us with science, whatever comes at us from these different accusations, or well, what about this? It looks like this DNA or this whatever. Good, let's go there. Let's talk about it. Because we know that the same God who created DNA, who created man, created all of it. And if love is really love, then bring it on. <laughs> Let's go. Let's dive in and not be afraid. That's what faith is, and that's why we need it. Can anyone um, <clears throat> pull out their Bible for me? Um, anyone bring their Bible? There's a convert in the room. All right. <laughs> First John. 416. She actually is a convert, by the way. I didn't just make that up. <laughs> she, she has a beautiful story. <coughs> just, the, just the first line, if you could read that for us. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. This is John, right? The beloved disciple. How was he able to write that? How was he able to write that to his friends, to the community that he was writing that to? 
right? This is the beloved disciple that was called by Jesus to come out of your boat and come and follow me. This was the beloved disciple that spent time with Jesus, that walked with him, that heard him talk, that heard him preach, that saw him bend down and heal lepers, to heal the blind, cure the sick. This John spent time with him. He encountered him. And I always think most beautifully, at the Last Supper, rested his head against the heart, the chest of Jesus, and heard his heart beat. This is just hours before Jesus was about to lay down his life for the world. And John, the beloved, heard his heart beat. I wonder how it sounded. That beat, that beat, that went. Right, now think about faith. Faith, not in ascent to a lofty ideal. It wasn't about, hmm, Jesus, run that idea of love by me one more time. How does that actually work in the concrete? You're talking abstractly. <laughs> No, John was saying, I know love. I know love that's come down in the flesh in this person. I've encountered him. I've met him. That's what Pope Benedict is saying is what faith is. It's an encounter with a person. I just want to give you two examples of what that, what, how else that looks like in the gospel. In John 8. We have Jesus encountering Mary Magdalene. Her name isn't given, but you all know the story. The woman is caught in adultery. And the person that she was committing adultery with, she's not brought forward, but she is. She's dragged out in this embarrassing, shaming way into the streets in front of all the people there, and especially the, the scribes who were there, the ones who knew the law. And they present her to Jesus and say, Rabbi, you're the teacher. You know the law. You know what happens whenever someone commits adultery. What do we do with her? You remember he bends down. He's writing in the sand. And then he says, He who is without sin cast the first stone. And one after another, they all drop their stones. And then this line. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. When we talk about an encounter with love, I can't think of a more beautiful, profound encounter than what Mary Magdalene had. And yet think about the position that she was in. I don't know how well dressed she was in. I'm guessing scantily. I don't know what her interior was like. It had to be just totally ashamed and fearful. And, and yet there she was, standing alone with Jesus. Talk about intimacy. Talk about vulnerability. Talk about a total abandonment to receive whatever it is that he comes, that he's ready to respond with. And this line always caught me too. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin. This is beautiful. He's still bending down. He's still on the ground writing out whatever it is. Scholars debate that. But then he actually looks up at Mary Magdalene. Think about that dimension. Here's a woman who, how many times has she been looked down upon by other men? Looked down upon saying, you're good for nothing else than this. If you don't do this, then you're nothing. If you don't do this, right? The condescending, the self-shaming, of so many other men, and yet here's the Lord, who not only took on our flesh, but actually bent down to remind her of her dignity, of who she is, of how she's beloved by Almighty God. Right, that's who God came for, all of us, because we've all fallen short, we've all sinned, and we all have our own shames, and we all have our own stuff that we're like, Lord, if you were to ever see this, you couldn't love it. You couldn't love me. And yet in this beautiful way, Jesus to Mary Magdalene and to all of us says, no, 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 I've come to remind you of who you are. This class is all about encountering God who is love, about being reminded of who we are. Because without love, man cannot live. <laughs> Lived out in Mary Magdalene's life. 
And it wasn't just that she encountered Jesus and his love and then went back to what she was doing. But this faith experience, this encounter with God who is love, made flesh, changed her entire life. Think about that definition Benedict gives us. Faith is an encounter with a person that changes our entire horizon, our entire outlook. Question, has her reality changed? Has her reality changed? Is, is she looked upon by people any differently? Is everything that she's been doing now any different? Is who she is, like is she not standing there anymore? I think this is big for us, because I think a lot of people think faith takes us from a different place into a different reality. And yet that's not faith. Faith doesn't remove us out of the obstacles of the world. Faith doesn't remove us out of persecution or out of suffering or out of difficulties. But faith changes. Faith is about vision. Faith is about being able to see with the eyes of Christ. That now Mary Magdalene can see herself and who she is, not as the rest of the world tells her, but as God tells her she is. Think about if we understood this now. Think about how many people in our world, whenever things got tough, whenever things, yes, the fire starts heating up and like, well, where's God right now? Where is he? Like, if he's not here for these difficult moments, then he must not be real. Like, no, that's not faith. Faith is that vision that allows us to withstand difficulties because we know that he's with us. We know that he's changed everything. Mary Magdalene, we know, followed him from that time forward, who was a part of his disciples, who was there at the foot of the cross. Everyone else left, but she was still there. And then she went off after the resurrection, too, like the other apostles. And she went up to France and other places and proclaimed Jesus. Jesus as love. Jesus as redeemer. Jesus one as one who's not afraid to go into the dark places of our lives, of our hearts, and to transform it. Not to necessarily change the reality, but to change our vision. To remind us of who we are and just how much we're loved. This is what faith is all about. This is what love is all about. This is why this class is so important. Because we always need to be reminded of who we are. There's a, a line that faith comes through listening. And li listening, and oftentimes we're listening to so many other things in our world as opposed to listening to the one who created us. Created us by love, in love, and for love. And that if this is really the deepest reality of who we are, then there's no other place that we should be to receive that identity than right here. And I hope that this class, as we kind of move forward, can help give you that. <laughs> and me that. I need to be reminded of it, too, of, of who I am. Because it's easy to fall into the lies. And yet, this is life-changing. I can tell you many people who, like Mary Magdalene and like many others, have had this encounter with love. And especially as it's revealed through John Paul II. And it changes everything. They're like, yeah, I don't want to go back to those other forms of love that I thought were love, that I was told was just a handshake, and yet I know afterwards the shame that I experienced, the brokenness, that none of the movies, none of the music will show you, right? They always just show you the passionate part, the energetic part, and yet they always cut it off right before you see any consequences of the real brokenness, of the real woundedness. And so that's why I don't want this class just to be about giving definitions or giving you different things to think about or but to truly encounter, to encounter the Lord who is love, who gives himself to us fully, constantly, most especially in the sacraments and at this altar at, at Mass. And so that's kind of the, the context for going forward and also a, a way to introduce Tom Franzek, who 